Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, and thank you for joining us for our Harvard Library conversation, more than a recording, Harvard Library's Engaging AV Collections. My name is Tom Hyrie, and I am the Associate University Librarian for Archives and Special Collections here at Harvard Library. And I just have to say, we are in for a real treat this morning, the opportunity to be able to listen to and see uh, some of the library's really incredible audio audiovisual collections, and then to hear from experts that will um, help us uh, see them in new ways. Um, by way of introduction, I would like to say that Harvard Library is committed to preserving the record of humanity in the broadest sense possible as part of our mission to advance the learning, research, and pursuit of truth that are at the heart of Harvard. For centuries, this meant primarily focusing on books, those wonderful objects created purposely to record and share knowledge, printed on a more or less stable media, and usually bound to provide protection and durability. With the invention of recorded sound in the late 19th century and moving image technology in the 20th century, new opportunities to capture, share, and preserve the human experience opened up and our holdings have evolved to include a massive number of audiovisual collections throughout the library. Some collections are devoted primarily to preservation of and access to AV materials, such as the Woodbury Poetry Room, an incomparable collection of the spoken word with generations of the most important poets reading from their work while visiting Harvard. But almost all other repositories include recordings to serve their broader mission as crucial evidence that help us understand and learn from the past. All told, the libraries at Harvard hold nearly a half million audiovisual items in a wide variety of formats. There is a particular urgency around the preservation of audiovisual materials, which face risks of degradation and obsolescence at an accelerated rate that outpaces many other information formats in library, archive, and museum collections today. With technology changing quickly, it is important to ensure that these AV materials remain accessible so that they can further support the university's mission and our scholars and students work. As a strategic initiative, we are working on a plan to scale up digitization and preservation to make our audiovisual materials accessible for generations to come. Today, we will have the opportunity to view and or listen to selection from our collection, selections from our collections, and perhaps more importantly, to have them contextualized by three different types of speakers. First, we will hear from Virginia Hunt, Harvard's university archivist, who will present what is believed to be the earliest known recording of President John F. Kennedy. The Harvard archives are Harvard's repository of university and personal archives with collections ranging across centuries and formats. We will then turn things over to Tan Nu Wen Din, a member of the Harvard College Class of 22. And you, if you are thinking the Harvard College 22, Class of 22 is about to graduate, you are right. And so um, before saying anything else, let me say congratulations to Tan Nu um, and a special thanks for, for being here in the throes of her last days as a, as a Harvard undergraduate. So uh, Tan Nu will talk about the student cinema tech at the Harvard Film Archive through the lens of the 2013 film Computer Chess. This film was recently shown at the weekly screening set up by the student, student cinema tech at the Harvard Film Archive. The Harvard Film Archive is a cinema tech and a film archive dedicated to the preservation and public exhibition of film. The student cinema tech series began this past fall, drawing undergraduates from all class years and academic divisions, as well as graduate students from all of Harvard's professional schools to participate in the screening selection and accompanying discourse for the weekly open to the public film screenings. And finally, we will hear from uh, distinguished professor Kay Kaufman Chalamet, the G. Gordon Watts Professor of Music and Professor of African and African American Studies. Professor Chalamet will present on the collection of Ethiopian music, courtesy of her fieldwork and research in Ethiopia and its diaspora that is housed in the Archive of World Music at the Loeb Music Library. The Archive of World Music collects archival film recordings of musics worldwide, as well as commercial audiovisual recordings and streaming resources of ethnomusicology 
ethnomusicology, ethnomusicological interest, excuse me. The archive was formally established in 1976 by Professor John Ward as the World Music Center and was moved into the Loeb Music Library as the Archive of World Music at the time of Professor Chalamet's appointment in 1992. So before we hear from our speakers, a few notes about Zoom. As you heard when you enter our virtual room, this event is being recorded and the link will be shared in the coming days. At the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see a Q&A icon button. Throughout the presentations, please enter questions for our speakers. And following the presentations, we'll open up question and answer, um, a question and answer period, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. And I will moderate that session. So thank you again for joining us. And I very much hope you enjoy the program. And it's my distinct pleasure to now turn things over to Ginny Hunt. Thanks. So um, my name is Ginny Hunt, as Tom mentioned, I'm the university archivist and I have oversight of Harvard's university archives. Um, today, I'm going to talk about something that I think is very interesting. Um, one thing I want to say is ask anyone here if they've ever wondered what a famous person was like before they were famous or, or anything interesting about them before everybody knew who they were. Uh, I admit that this was probably one of the reasons why I became an archivist. Being able to do a deeper dive into the backstory of lesser known details about people that we know through a carefully curated, constructed public persona was very, was very um, sort of attractive to me in getting, in getting into this field. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have a little glimpse of someone who was quite famous, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. And that is President John F. Kennedy. So next slide, please. So before I play the clip, I just want to give you a little background about this recording. Um, and then afterwards, some details and information about why we would have a recording like this at the Harvard University Archives. In 2017, the University, Arch the University Archives, in collaboration with many other Boston area institutions, hosted an exhibition called JFK's Harvard, Harvard's JFK. And this was to celebrate what would have been John F. Kennedy's 100th birthday. The archives has a huge amount of material related to the Kennedys. Um, it's partially because the Kennedys, a lot of the Kennedy family have attended Harvard. Um, there's a lot of individuals in the Kennedy family who have connections to Harvard through committees and work supporting Harvard. Um, and also because when John Kennedy passed away, in order to create a um, sort of tribute to his life and work, the Ken Harvard Kennedy School was established and um, with the Institute of Politics. So a lot of the material we have from the Kennedy family related to the Kennedy family is also from that time and um, letters and photographs and things like that. So for th so um, can we go to the next slide, Grace? So for this exhibition, we partnered with the Weissman Preservation Center to digitize and make available what we believe to be the earliest recording of John F. Kennedy in a public repository. This recording is one of many in a collection of recordings that were created by Professor Frederick Clifton Packard Jr. Packard's classes, um, among, among Packard's classes uh, were public speaking classes. Kennedy was a student in Packard's English F public speaking class in 1937 when this recording was made. Um, and the recording you can see in an image here is were made on what are called aluminum discs. These are a low fidelity type of recording. So when you are listening to the clip, you have to listen very closely because there's a lot of static. Um, and even with digital enhancement, it can be very difficult to, to, to take that away. So can we play the clip? My name is John F. Kennedy. I'm going to speak this morning on a subject we've spoken of twice before, Hugo Black. I'd like to take it from the angle of what's going to happen to Mr. Black if anything can happen. We all know the circumstances surrounding Mr. Black's appointment to the Supreme Court. Whether Mr. Black's appointment to the court is a correct one, it's hard to say. It was evidently done in the heat of presidential anger at the uh, conservative element 
who did not fax Mr. Roosevelt's court plan. Whether Mr. Roosevelt was right in not taking revenge on Congress is hard to say. He evidently had his reasons and he went forward as he thought. But Mr. Black's stand has been one, has been one uh, in the last few months, last few weeks rather, that has is, that is, uh, been one of secrecy, something that a uh, Supreme Court judge should not be expected to do. And Mr. Black received uh, notice of his appointment to the Supreme Court. In a few days, he went down and in secrecy took an oath of office. Then he went to Europe. Why should he have taken this oath this way? Well, there's very few reasons. Maybe he was just in a hurry to get to Europe. Or maybe it was because he wanted to do it as quietly as possible. When he arrived in England, everything was going well until Paul Block's paper disclosed the fact that Mr. Black was a member of the Supreme, was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, this news pushed all the Japanese war off the front page and became of utmost importance to the United States. Really, the, the, the uh, part that the Supreme Court has held for the last two years. Okay, thanks. So, a couple things right away that we notice. Um, that is clearly John Kennedy. You can you can hear that very distinctive John Kennedy voice, the way he talks, the sort of cadence that he uses. He's a little bit less um, smooth than he was when he was president, but you can already hear this sort of way that he speaks and, and, and the way that he um, articulates his topic and, 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 and the cadence that he uses. Um, so another thing that's kind of interesting about this recording is that it was about a topic that was um, a contemporary topic and it was a topic that was interesting to him um, relating to government and what was happening. And what was happening at the time is that Franklin Delano Roosevelt had appointed Hugo Black to the Supreme Court. And it became known soon after that, that Black would, had been a member of the Ku Klux Klan. So we can already see Kennedy's sort of eye into the political environment and commenting on these things. Just to give you a context for that, um, we know from, even though we have not digitized all of these recordings, we know from um, information we have about other recordings in Packard's class that many of the students talked about things like how to get a, how to find a good wife, how to fry an egg, how to, um, you know, run a mile quickly. So there was a real difference between what Kennedy chose to talk about and what the other students did. He almost took this opportunity to start practicing for something that he saw in the future rather than just checking something off for a class. Um, you notice that it seemed like it cut off uh, during the presentation. That's because this is probably just a piece of this longer speech that he gave. Packard, probably to save space on the disc and just to get a sample that he needed, would just record part of what each of these students were giving their speeches about. Um, some other things you might want to know, Kennedy was 20 years old at the time of this recording. He was a sophomore at Harvard College. He was living in Winthrop House at the time. Um, and he was an OK student. And when we have time for questions later, I can talk more about that. Um, but interestingly enough, after this fabulous speech, he got a C in this class, which I think is very interesting. So why do we have this recording? Well, this recording is part of Frederick, Frederick, Black, Frederick Clifton Packard's faculty papers collection. I probably should have taken Packard's class. This recording was literally one of hundreds that we have at the archives. We hope to eventually digitize them all. Packard taught this class at Harvard's Bolton Chapel, which has really nice acoustics. And he would, had been recording his students since the 1920s, so he had been moving through various types of audio um, media as, as he recorded the classes. And so we have samples of that. He kind of kept up with the times. Um, Packard also as, was, so he was very interested in studying speaking and voices and what they sounded like. And as Tom mentioned about the poetry collection, he was instrumental in establishing the Harvard Vocarium, which is at the Harvard Poetry Collection. Um, that project produced recordings of famous poets like T.S. Eliot, Elizabeth Bishop, 
Wallace Stevens and Ezra Pound, to name a few. So as Tom mentioned in his intro, intro, the University Archives documents the history of the university. And part of that work is to document and preserve the work and research of our faculty. Again, bringing this full circle, this is why we have this recording here. What is interesting about that is that our collections contain research and information from nearly every discipline taught at Harvard and also evidence of the individuals who moved through the university over time. So this is just one example illustrating the importance of preserving faculty research and teaching at the archives and eventually digitizing some of it to reveal some of more interesting surprises. Next slide. So I'm just going to conclude my comments at this point, um, but I'm happy to answer more questions about this later on when we have the opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Ginny, and wow, it's so incredible to hear JFK's uh, voice as a proto orator uh, that he that he became. Um, uh, so, um, so we've heard from a really example of a, a, a really fine library voice, and now we have a real privilege to get a student perspective on the. Um, on, on our audiovisual collections in the library. And to do that, I will turn things over to Tom New. Over to you, Tom New. Thank you. Um, can you see me and hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Tom New. I am uh, studying East Asian history with the secondary in AFES. And uh, I will be presenting on the film Computer Chess and the Harvard Film Archive Student Cinematheque Initiative. Um, so to begin, I'd like to introduce a quote from a filmmaker that I really like. Um, next slide, yes. Simple quote, oh, how Shakespeare would have loved cinema. So this is from Derek Jarman, uh, from a book that he wrote in 1984, towards the end of his life. Derek Jarman is an experimental filmmaker, um, a British experimental, filmmaker. Um, and what I love about this quote is the way that it connects cinema, connects film, which is a new medium with literature, which is something that has been around for a really long time. And I like how Jarman is connecting cinema with Shakespeare, um, because I think the art form that Shakespeare was pioneering and cinema were very are very similar um, at the beginning. They're both considered, they were both considered entertainment for the masses and not considered uh, a serious art. Um, but then from that underdog position over time, um, it became an art. People recognize it for um, the artistic medium that it is. Um, there are a lot of difficult films that I would describe as an artwork, things that are really difficult to see. Um, from the beginning because not a lot of places are screening it, um, but also difficult as in conceptually, artistically, there's a lot going on and it requires intense engagement. Uh, and Derek Jarman is one of the filmmakers who make that kind of film. Um, and in 2019, there was a retrospective of Derek Jarman at uh, the Harvard Film Archive. Um, and I bring that up because that is representative of the activities that take place at the Harvard Film Archive, um, which regularly highlights important filmmakers. And so how is cinema and art and what are its different forms and styles and contexts? Who are the artists? Um, you can get a really good sense of what all of that is by going to the cinema and going to the Harvard Film Archive. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is film culture at Harvard. Um, next side piece, um, through these two pictures. Um, the first picture is, uh, was featured in the Harvard Magazine. Um, pictured is um, Stanley Cavell and Robert Gardner. Uh, the caption reads that, the ca caption describes um, these two figures as the dual patriarchs of uh, film studies and filmmaking at Harvard. Um, Stanley Cavell is a philosopher and uh, Robert Gardner is a filmmaker and a pioneer of ethnographic filmmaking. And together they set up the Harvard Film Archive, uh, acquiring like a massive collection of important uh, films on 35 millimeter. 
And behind them, you can see the Carbon Center, the home of the visual arts and uh, film at Harvard. Uh, the second picture is um, the current uh, Harvard Film Archive director, Hayden Guest, in conversation with uh, Akosua Adoma Owusu, who's a visiting uh, lecturer at Harvard, um, teaching nonfiction filmmaking. Um, so with these two pictures, I wanna say that film is diverse and interdisciplinary and has a really strong presence at Harvard. Um, next slide, please. So over the pandemic, uh, the film archive closed down, but in April, it has now returned with regular programming. Um, in the picture, you can see what the lecture hall looks like. Um, it's a ha it has 188 seats, and I just think it's beautiful. Um, the Harvard Film Archive has a lot of rare 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter prints that are regularly programmed. And uh, because over the pandemic, the film archive closed down, um, the student cinematech started up and uh, got the chance to draw on this really special collection. And here you can see um, this is from an event uh, of the student cinematech um, of a film made by Thai filmmaker. A uh, in 2004, um, and it's been being introduced by a graduate student, Hannah Beck. Um, yeah, so the Student Cinematech is a, next slide please, is a new initiative that started last year. Um, we screened films from the HFA collection. Um, there are a lot of people in the group from um, everywhere, and we have managed to uh, organize about 20 programs uh, over the academic year. So pictured here is the poster for Atanajua, The Fast Runner. I included this picture because this is the first, the very first film that I got to present at the Harvard Film Archive. And it was a really fun um, and exciting experience because um, I decided to present it kind of last minute, um, but it came together super quickly. And it was the first time that I get to kind of engage with the film that I had never seen before using um, language and uh, concepts that I was um, researching as part of my thesis. So it felt like a really empowering um, experience. Uh, but the film that I really want to talk about today, the topic of the talk is the uh, computer chess. Next slide, please. So computer chess is, uh, it came up because we were looking for um, first films. We thought it would, be, it would be really cool to program first films and student films to uh, people because they have a certain kind of energy that uh, Hayden Guess has compared to uh, Roland Barthes' idea of the, the writerly text um, films that when you see them, it makes you want to make films. And so Computer Chess is directed by Andrew Pajowski, who graduated from here uh, in 1999. Um, the film was released in 2019, but it has the look of the 1970s because of the camera that was used to uh, make it. And what's really cool about this film and its relationship to the HFA is that because Andrew used to go here, he has a relationship with HFA. And um, what ended up happening is that the HFA holds production material uh, for this film, all the raw footage and audio, edits, teasers, promotional material. So this is really important archivally. And the camera used to shoot the film is also in the collection. And for the screening, we get to uh, look at it a little bit. Um, so what does it mean when, when I say it looks like it's the 70s? Um, I think uh, it will be, yeah, now's a good time to watch the video clip so that you can have a good sense of what it means. Um, yeah, could we play it, please? We are at the frontier, gentlemen, sailing hyperspace and nowhere more than the futurist world of computer chess. I greet you for our annual North American Computer Chess Tournament and present you with a panel of the best and the brightest. 
from my left, there is Les Carbray from Allied Laboratories. Martin Buescher sitting in for Tom Cheshire. And that's last year's winner, Tsar 2.0 from Caltech. Roland McVeigh from MIT. And finally, Mike Papageorge, who is an independent programmer. I want to pose to our dis very distinguished panel. Is there a computer program in the house that can stand up to a human chess master? And that's me. When will a machine beat me? Last year you didn't exactly win, so have you made some uh, major breakthroughs since last year? It's an interesting question because it's, it's not about individual breakthroughs so much. I mean, we're throwing everything we can at this problem. We're, we're, we've experimented some with parallel processing and then we're doing selective search. And all the algorithmic and software things that we're doing makes a difference. Uh, it does make an improvement, but it's it's dwarfed by the improvement we get just with better hardware. There's no question that hardware speed has definitely led to stronger gameplay. Uh, I think we're searching the tree deeply enough now that we're catching all the tactical issues. Um, but Stasia's greatest weakness, and I think this applies to all of our programs really, is that they all suffer from an almost embarrassing lack of positional understanding. So uh, at MIT this year, we've uh, enlisted the help of a grandmaster. Uh, he's been instrumental in helping us fine-tune our evaluation function. Uh, Mr. Papa George, we haven't heard from you yet. You usually have a very unique perspective. Well, frankly, Pat, I'm about as interested in this discussion as I am in my competitors' programming. Sooner or later, one of these guys is going to come up with a program that's able to beat you. 83, 85, who cares? A machine will never be able to beat the finest human player. Gentlemen. Welcome to the annual NACPS Computer Chess Tournament. The fact that you're in this room means that you are some of the greatest computer programmers working in North America today. So let's keep it light, let's keep it collegial, be respectful, and of course have fun. Let's begin round one. All right, I, <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed that clip. I really love this film. Um, so Andrew Bajowski describes it as a period piece um, in the sense that but it's not period as in you know the 19th century, but this is the, this is the 80s. Um, but the sense of period is so intense because the media paradigm that was that people were entering into at that time was totally it looked totally different from what we have now um, with all the technology and programming is so common. Back then it was all about just chess and What's really nice about this film is that it's, he's not recreating the period feel solely by like making people wear clothes a certain way and then getting the machines from the, the 80s out, but also by actually using the camera from that era. And so you get image quality that's, that looks really low. That doesn't look like films that are made and released nowadays, but uh, looks like something from back then, which makes this film really special and uh, highly regarded. Um, within the film world. And so the next thing I want to say is this film was not shown alone. It was shown with other films. Um, part of the part of the, the pedagogical value of the uh, student cinematech is that we get to experiment with programming. And what that means is pairing films with different films in order to facilitate a conversation. And the films that um, Computer Chess will pair with is Route One. Um, and Close for Comfort. So these are films that Andrew Bujowski made or participated in making as a student. Route One is a really special film and it's like pure, it's, it sits within part of Harvard film culture and Harvard film uh, filmmaking pedagogy. It's made in VS50, which is the 16 millimeter intro to filmmaking class taught by Ross McKeewee. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a 16 millimeter film that Andrew made with uh, his classmates when he was a sophomore here. Um, and we screened it digitally. It's a really, really great film to look at. And you can see kind of uh, some of the resonances with computer chess, especially in the, uh, in the way that um, the camera pays attention to machinery. And then Close for Comfort is Andrew Bujowski's thesis film. This is the real rare piece. We get to see it on 16 millimeter. Um, and I think that's like the only print. Um, you cannot see this film anywhere. And Andrew doesn't want it um, digitized and released, I think. And so that was a real treat.
um, route one too, because it's like a film made as part of a class, it's unlikely that it will be, it will ever get widely released. And so computer test is more easy to come by. I actually saw it um, online before seeing it um, projected, but to be able to see all three films together, um, that was something really special that was only possible because um, of the Harvard Film Archive. Um, yeah, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Tom New. That was really incredible. And what I was uh, um, reflecting on is, is this movement to use the incomparable resources of the Harvard Film Archive to develop experiences not for students, but with students. And I think the work that you and your, your colleagues uh, and um, friends and fellow students have done is, is a really, really wonderful example of how we can engage um, you know, different audiences using these, these collections. Um, so with that, our, our, our third and, and, and final uh, presenter is uh, Kay Chalamet. And Kay, with no further ado, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. So I am here to sing the praises of the Archive of World Music, located in the Ida Kuhn Loeb Music Library for 30 years now. It contains an extensive collection of published records, tapes and films about music, as well as original ethnographic field recordings contributed by ethnomusicologists. I've deposited all of my major field collections and consider archiving one of the primary responsibilities of scholars such as myself who record music worldwide. All of the recordings I deposited in the archive of world music come with a story but I'd like to tell you a special one. I lived in Ethiopia carrying out my doctoral research during 1974 and 75, years that saw the beginning of a revolution that overthrew longtime emperor Haile Selassie and resulted in 17 years of violence. Late one evening in 1975 at the height of the revolution, I received a telephone call at my Addis Ababa apartment from an official at radio station Voice of the Gospel. Please show the next slide. He told me that he feared that their archives would be destroyed by revolutionary forces. He asked me to come as soon as possible with any blank tapes I had and to make copies of any recordings I wished to save. I gathered my spare tapes and went to the radio station the next day. For hours, I worked with a technician there, trying to identify recordings of particular historical interest and value. Among the recordings I came across were those of Orchestra Ethiopia, a folklore orchestra comprised of traditional musicians from across the country. And we can show the next slide. Orchestra Ethiopia was founded in 1963 by visiting Egyptian composer Halim el Dab under sponsorship of Emperor Haile Selassie. The recordings in the radio archive dated from the orchestra's first broadcast in 1964 on Radio Voice of the Gospel. No other recordings of this historical broadcast exist and the collection of which it is part documents the inception of an important musical ensemble that had a continued life during the revolution and afterwards in the American diaspora. We can turn to the next slide. Here you see a photograph of Orchestra Ethiopia from around the same time as the recording I will play with an array of traditional Ethiopian instruments formally played only by individual musicians. This new ensemble was patterned after Western groups and uh, with several like instruments on a part. Emperor Haile Selassie first encountered Western orchestras and bands during trips abroad when he was the Ethiopian regent in the 1920s. 
These early archival recordings of Orth Orchestra Ethiopia allow us to experience Ethiopian ethnic music in a new orchestral format. Originally conceived in the 1960s to celebrate diverse Ethiopian communities within an imperial framework, the ensembles that were its heirs became by the 1990s abroad in the Ethiopian American diaspora, a nostalgic symbol of traditional Ethiopian identity and culture. In a minute, we'll hear part of a recording by Orchestra Ethiopia from the Archive of World Music. The orchestra from the beginning had not just instrumentalists, but singers and dancers who performed with them. They even had some special effects you will hear. The recording starts with chords played by a six string lyre, then a drum enters, followed by other instruments, including flutes and one stringed bowed lutes. Then the entire ensemble joins in unison. Next comes in a male singer responded to by a chorus. Finally, you will all recognize what comes next and then the entire orchestra re-enters. So let's hear the recording now and we'll talk a little more about it afterwards. Orchestra Ethiopia recordings today preserved in the Archive of World Music at Harvard also meant a great deal to their founder and conductor, Halim el Dab. and we can show the next slide. The notes I had copied at Radio Voice of the Gospel became part of the electronic record when I deposited the recordings in the Archive of World Music. In late 2004, I received an email from Halim El Dobbs research assistant at Kent State University where he taught, who had recognized some of El Dobbs compositions recorded for Radio Voice of the Gospel from my collection's finding aids or finding guide. I arranged for copies of these materials to be sent to El Dobbs who did not have copies of the radio tapes for his own archive. So in this way, one archive benefits another and at the same time enhances a world of knowledge. Thank you.
Um, that was incredible, Kay. And I think the importance of your work and the story you told is self-evident, but worth reinforcing that you were able to capture and just share, you know, a piece of culture that would that we would not be able to know about if it weren't for your work. And I just think it underscores the absolute importance of the archive of world music and the library's efforts to um, capture and uh, preserve and make accessible recordings like this. So it's a very, very powerful story. And um, thank you so much. Um, so Welcome. we have, um, you know, our, our session goes till about noon today, and we have an opportunity for Q&A from, from the audience. I, uh, it's my privilege to get to chair this group, and I um, would not, uh, uh, I, I don't want to squander that, that, that privilege, and so I, you know, I have a few questions for, or I have a question for each of our panelists, and I think maybe I will um, go in, in reverse, and, and Kate, start with you. So you you talk like really specifically about some of the work that you've done, but you've also been this um, ideal faculty collaborator for for the library in, in the growth of the archive of world music over the course of the last several decades. And I, I don't is there a way that you could just reflect on how the the archive itself has grown and changed over the course of you know the past several years and sort of like where where you might think you know it, it it's it's going you know kind of in, in a you, know, you just have a unique insight into that that i think would be really lovely to hear from well thanks we you know we started with there were some recordings um commercial recordings left by john ward and then over the years we have announced to our graduating doctoral students to colleagues across the world that we have an archive please deposit your collections and over the years we've amassed a wonderful collection of original field recordings from the americas from north america from this region from uh, a whole through the middle east East into Asia because our fact we have faculty working in that area. So there has been a lot of ethnographic growth and we um, really try to imbue our students with the understanding that if you're going to go and record and do research, you also need to archive. It's very important. Um, and the other thing I, I guess I would say is that we have now a huge collection of sound recordings and you know, these are ephemeral items. Now most people don't have um, record players at home. These are archival items. They have very short shelf lives. And so what we are is also a wonderful repository for commercial sound recordings. And when I move the archive with the collaboration, collaboration with the library, at my time of appointment, we also started with um, video. And so it's not just the Harvard Film Archive that's interested in the real world of the screen. We have a whole collection now, a large and really complete collection of ethnographic film and video and musical video. So it is a wonderful collection and um, we have documented classes we have taught with team research. I could go on, you get the picture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know that's um, really incredible. Get that that wider view of the archive. Um, Tom New, as I was listening to you, one of the things I was reflecting on, and I was <laughs> actually thinking about um, Ginny and the archives, because you know the archives is the um, is the home of the record of so many student organizations, and there is this really kind of cool thing about student organizations is that there are there's a group that start them up and then they have continuity over generations of, of harvard students and so you you and and your um you know your partners in starting the student cinema tech have started something something new gotten it off off the ground um and i'm just like i'd love it if you could share what you know maybe you've learned in the last year or so that you might want to impart to successive generations you know people who are going to come in and take over the student cinema tech, you know, in, uh, you know, as part of the legacy that you've become. Wow, thank you for that question. That is a really, really great question. Um, yeah, I am super excited. I feel really lucky that I get to be here at this time and to, to start a, an initiative with, you know, all of my friends and colleagues and teachers. Um, it's really exciting. 
what have I learned in the past year? Um, I, I think the, the thing that I learned is very simple and, and rather self-evident, which is that we should go to the cinema. Um, film in the cinema is very different and watching films with other people is an incredible experience. And to be up there in that podium and introducing a film, engaging with it on a personal level, but also relating to the audience in real time, that is such a different way of learning about film and um, yeah, it's just incredible. It's something that I think people with an interest in film studies, um, students like me should really go through in order to, to deepen their understanding and their relationship with this art form, I think is essential. That's, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, um, thank you. And Ginny, yeah, the question I, I, I kind of went back and forth whether there's zero in on JFK and maybe I will do that in a little bit, but it, um, you, the kind of format of this is like we ask you know, to share one piece and let's talk specifically about it. But I am interested to know what we can say about the audiovisual recording collection of the archives in general and you know what what we can learn about it not only by university history but you know far you know the holdings of the archives go far you know it's like this valuable historical um resource for helping us understand the history of the united states and 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 the world so but and so that's a big question asking you to summarize but it but i think like giving a character of the holdings overall might help well yeah thank you tom and i think you touched on a, like a lot of what I would say about this is that there's a there's a real wide spectrum. You know, there's the sort of focused on Harvard, although the focused on Harvard can be really interesting. Like the student groups, we have a lot of student groups that do engage in performance and audiovisual materials. So we have things that relate to that. Um, we have recordings that relate to things that happen at Harvard where individuals have come through and so examples of that are like we have recordings of a NATO meeting that happened at Harvard in 1957. Um, we have um, almost a huge amount of recording from WHRB, which was the Harvard radio broadcasting um, uh, radio station, which sounds like, okay, student group, but the people that they interviewed on these recordings are amazing in terms of the world of music. Like they had everybody you can imagine. Um, and then, you know, similarly, like Dr. Chalamet is talking about, like we have archives of um, the sort of research evidence that, that we have, um, for instance, Carl Teeter, who studied um, Wiat and Malice Passamaquoddy, which are two Native American languages. Wiat is actually a language that is nearly extinct, but there's a resurgence of people trying to learn to speak it we have recordings and film in the university archives of some of the like last sort of native speakers of Wiat. So there is this kind of wide range. We have, we have sports. So it's really, like you said, there's this kind of like kind of hyper-focused lens, but I always think that sort of like the JFK recording, taking it back to that, it, it's a thread. So you're hearing, you may see a recording about JFK and you might approach it because you know who JFK is now. But what I was trying to talk about is like, how, how does that recording fit into the larger mosaic of what we do here? And, and I think that that's what makes it so interesting. So I'm not gonna go on for hours, but mm -hmm. definitely more specific questions or come visit or talk to me. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Um, okay, so, uh, Opening up questions to the audience is, you know, what, what we'd like to do for our, you know, our remaining minutes here. And I'm really um, glad that um, we have uh, at least one question for the audience that is, you know, can prime the pump a little bit. And it's for, it's for you, Tom New. And, um, it, and the question is, can you discuss what led you to your interest in the HFA? Was it through classes you were taking or have art films always been an interest of yours? Thank you so much for this question. Um, so I I started getting into film and filmmaking when I was in high school, um, and I am from Vietnam, um, from Hanoi, Vietnam, and uh, that's how I got uh, in touch with the filmmaking community there. And when I got here, I I became aware of classes like um, uh, Dennis Lim's Rethinking Documentary. This is something that I took in my freshman year, 
and it was so cool to see the interface between um, film culture in Vietnam and film culture in America through experimental films and art films. So that's how it started for me. And that's just like became, um, you know, it gained momentum over time. Okay, we have a, um, another question and, um, and I think, uh, I think it's Ginny, I know that you will have something to say about this, but I think Kay, you can um, speak to it as well. And it's it's like, will we learn how later to access materials? And so it's so I think it's generally a question is like, how does the library provide access to um, to holdings like this? Um, that's actually a very complicated question um, because there are ethical issues and permission issues I'm, when one has recorded the music of others. And so very often in the archival collections, one needs permission to access materials. And generally when one makes a field recording, one at that point asks someone how would you like this handled? Do you want people to hear this? There are some items that people do not want played out of the community that are restricted by gender um, or other criteria. Now, in the case of the recording I played for you, that was a recording from Radio Voice of the Gospel and they charged me with saving it. And that's what I've done. And what's really been fascinating is that I, I ended up having another recording that I made accidentally myself of a TV show. It's it's not a very good technological recording, but it's the only one that exists of a revolutionary performance by the same group. So it, you just don't know what you will be doing that will have immense value later on, but you also have to along, try to make plans when you can for permission and for knowing how to properly handle things. Uh, we don't have the same issues with commercial recordings. Yeah, Ginny, I imagine you have a way to reflect on access and, and how we're approaching that as, as well. Well, first, I just want to say thank you, Kay, for doing that work, because a lot of things do come in and people haven't done that work. And it does complicate things on our end at the archives where we, you know, because what we want to do is we want to make things as accessible as possible. So we're looking for ways to open those doors and find those things. Um, I would say that you know, there's there's these kind of high level ways that we are making things accessible by having these big projects at the university where we where we're collaborating and we're we're working together on a subject or a background. But um, what we try to do at the archives is we think a lot about what would be the research value or the need to make this available within the context that we can at that moment. So with the Kennedy recording, we've got hundreds of recordings. Um, like that, but we were doing an exhibition to commemorate Kennedy's 100th birthday. It seemed like a good way to do that. Um, what we try to do at the very beginning is just make the public aware that there actually are recordings in collections, even if we don't necessarily yet have the medium to play them. Um, there's, a, there's dangers in that, and as I've been learning myself, you know, when you play something that's an older format, especially a very delicate format, you can lose um, information the minute you do that. So we like to work, I like to work with the experts at Weissman. Um, one of my colleagues who's here quietly, Kaylee Ackerman, has been really helpful in guiding us to make good decisions about that so that we don't end up ruining this material. But um, and then some of it, I think, is just public driven, like what what are we hearing that people need and want to know about in that moment? And if we can, let's direct our let's direct ourselves that way. Um, yeah, go ahead. Can I just add a word? Because this brings Ton Nu in. I think we use these materials for our classes and they can transform the experience of our undergrads and graduate students um, when they encounter a recording that they didn't know existed. And we can do it online. I mean, there, the technologies make all of this possible. Indeed, and what, what I would add to all of this is the work the library does in this sphere is to support connecting these collections to others in a multitude of ways. And um, my colleagues are so brilliant at working with um, 
faculty, students, and people with general interest to help discover and find and uh, access materials. And you know, we are we are here. We are here to help. Um, so I, you know, we've reached our time, and uh, I think the way to conclude is by just saying a hearty thanks to all of you for attending, and an immense thanks to these three brilliant uh, panelists. Um, you know, I, I feel so privileged to have so many incredible, knowledgeable colleagues in the library, an incomparable student population to um, to get to work with, and then um, faculty who um, not only make extraordinarily extraordinary uses of our collection, but in fact help us build and understand it. And so, um, you know, I think that's been demonstrated here today. And so thank you to the three of you. And um, we wish all of you um, very, a really wonderful afternoon and weekend. Thank you.